Hi everyone, Justin Gray here from Immersive Mastering. Today I'm going to make a video dedicated to Dolby Atmos music production, specifically understanding the role of mastering in the process and how it is integrated into the production and mixing process. Before I continue, please do subscribe to my YouTube channel. I've done a series of videos on Dolby Atmos music production uh, demonstrating the potential of this immersive audio format. Uh, explaining the end user experience, explaining how we can prepare our music to mix and produce in this format, and I'll be continuing to explore uh, production techniques, mastering techniques, uh, in both Dolby Atmos and beyond. I'd also encourage you to visit my website, www.immersivemastering.com. It'd be my pleasure to share with you the music of the artists I've had the pleasure of working with from around the world uh, in both Dolby Atmos and traditional stereo and multi-channel formats. Just to give you a quick... Uh, tour of the studio where I am here at Immersive Mastering. My playback system is a 714 playback system. This room has been tuned to the Dolby spec for home entertainment, um, mixing and mastering within in the for Dolby Atmos Music. Uh, very happy to be using you know a 7.0 7 array by Lipinski. My LFEs are by Lipinski. My height channels are by uh, Dolby, the SLS speakers. Um, and Sonic averaging, as I'm going to explain, it's necessary in this format that we consider headphones as our sonic averaging tools. Um, and so, just to give you a quick intro to the studio. So, mastering in Atmos, what does it mean? I've explained this more in previous videos. For anyone who doesn't understand it, I encourage you to go there or look at some of the other brilliant resources that are out there for explaining what is Dolby Atmos. In essence, we need to be reminded that it is, an, uh, it is a multi-channel, object-based audio format. Because of these um, objects, these sonic objects which exist in this sphere, um, traditional bus processing does not work in this production workflow. When I'm working, you can see behind here in the video the Dolby Atmos uh, renderer. When I'm working with the renderer, there uh, is no master bus channel where I can put any amount of uh, you know sonic tools for manipulation of the entire mix at once. This means equalization, harmonic characteristics, or of course dynamic control like compression and limiting. There are however techniques to do this in various ways within you know I'm working with Pro Tools, Pro Tools uh, HD connected with the Dolby Atmos renderer and then the Avid Matrix going out. Um, there are ways to work around this, but it is not as simple as one discrete bus where we can manipulate the entire mix. This does pose some challenges, especially when we look at it as a traditional mastering process, whether for discrete channel music, whether stereo or multi-channel. But it is also a reminder that when we're working in this immersive audio format, that Mastering is not only about loudness. It is not only about manipulating um, how loud something is and controlling its dynamic range. Uh, and in fact, when working in 714, uh, dynamic range is highly valuable. And this format, you know, not unlike stereo. I mean, obviously, dynamics should always just represent the emotionality of the music. But in this format, dynamics breathe in a very inspiring and a very engaging way. For the mastering engineers out there, that I'll go over this quickly, but for anyone who's watching this, just as a quick reminder as to what is a mastering engineer's role, uh, I find that this to be helpful in reminding us how we integrate into the Dolby Atmos music production process. Really, we are hired to prepare music for final delivery. That can include finalizing tonality, dynamic range, loudness, sequencing of an album. But really, we're being um, engaged with for our ears and our aesthetic and that we work with appropriate tools in a trusted sonic environment. We use things like sonic averaging or, you know, and our own experience to guarantee translation so that somebody's music goes into the world and it's experienced the way it is intended. And it is important that we have intimate and current understanding of the delivery formats and the end user experience. I've actually done a separate video just on Dolby Atmos end user experience that I would encourage you to watch. So when it comes to mastering in this format, 
I'm going to use a bit of a wordy title, and I hope uh, that it uh, clarifies how I would define the role of a mastering engineer and my role as a mastering engineer in Dolby Atmos Music production workflows. Multi-channel object-based stem mastering. Lots of words, I know. Multi-channel object-based stem mastering. The reason I have come up with this term for myself of explaining, you know, what is my role, how am I integrating into this, is that in object-based music production workflows, whether Pro Tools or a different DAW, but regardless, using the Dolby Atmos uh, renderer or the Dolby Atmos mastering suite, objects are key to understand. Objects are not discrete channel information, and therefore they cannot be baked into a multi-channel delivery, and therefore we have to keep them as objects right up until the end delivery. This is very important to understand because it means that we have no choice but to work on the entire file as a whole. So, options for Dolby Atmos mastering services when working with myself. Um, option one, if the music is produced in Pro Tools using the Dolby Atmos renderer, we've got a perfect workflow in the sense that a mix engineer will work in Pro Tools and then once they're finished with their mix and they're looking for my help to help with finalizing, help with confirming levels, help with, you know, ensuring the, the appropriate uh, dynamic range for final delivery, help with the overall tonality, help with understanding and making sure that the LFE and the sub-channels are, are hitting at the right level. Because maybe they're working in, a, in an inspiring environment, but it hasn't been tuned to the Dolby spec, and the gear that they're working with isn't up to sort of mastering grade to guarantee that translation. Totally fine. I mean, this is why traditional mastering studios exist as well um, for, for mix engineers uh, in the stereo and multi-channel formats. What will happen is that mix engineer will deliver their entire session to me. Now, they can bounce things down. They can commit things, free, um, freeze things, etc., as required for, for plugins and processing. But they're going to deliver the entire session to me, all of their stems, because we cannot bake those objects into anything if we want to maintain the objects uh, in the final delivery, which we do. The reason being that those objects are key for then being re-spatialized uh, for the end user. Again, I've explored this in, an, in another video, so I won't go too far down this road, but it's important to understand that these objects that we use in this format when they are kept as objects and they are recorded into a final master file as objects, those objects then remain as object metadata that are then decoded by things like Apple Music Spatial Audio, um, Android system for it, Tidal HD's system for it, Pure Audio Blu-ray system for it. If we take those objects and we bake them into channels, which is possible, we lose that scalability in how the system's designed. Not that it won't work, but then we just go into fold downs rather than object fold downs or what I would or object decoding. So this is where multi-channel, we're working with a multi-channel system, object-based stem mastering. It it is stem mastering, it's full on stem mastering. And one could look at it absolutely like mixing, just second stage mixing or finalizing, whatever we want to call it. The role of the mastering engineer, my role in this situation, is to take that session and go through and make sure that it's translating, to respect what the artist has created, but also just like when stereo mastering, it's not just about loudness, it's not just about this. I'm going in and working with what they've provided and using my system and using my sonic environment and more importantly, my you know, creative aesthetic to, to just guarantee that it's going to get out into the world the way that it should to sequence an album appropriately. All of those skills that we've developed in mastering engineers, they still apply. And, you know, there have been great debates over STEM mastering. And I personally, in a stereo situation, I'm open to it, but I certainly work mainly with just two-channel or five-channel or seven-channel um, deliveries rather than too much STEM mastering. In Atmos, it's all STEM mastering. Multi-channel, object-based STEM mastering. When it's Pro Tools and the Dolby Atmos renderer, it is deliver the file, and I open it up, and I just take it from there, like we're passing the baton. It's quite beautiful, actually. 
Um, option two, music is produced outside of Pro Tools. This is, um, the sky is the limit here. Let me just explain an example of a record that I'm working on right now um, where the artist was using Reaper and, and some of the like, things like sound particles. Um, there are also obviously t tools by EarCam, for instance, like these multi-channel uh, audio suites. So that artist was not using objects. However, they were still creating a 12-channel because they wanted it to be in Dolby Atmos. They were still creating a discrete 12-channel delivery that they then wanted to translate into Dolby Atmos. What I've done is worked with that artist to then make decisions around what should be delivered for object placement, what should be baked into re respective channels, and we just have to work on a, a delivery system that makes sense for their original vision to then translate into the Atmos system, and then I will, you know, again, it certainly is a fine line between mastering and mixing at this point, but the you know, I still consider that that artist mixed their music, they still produce their music, and then I'm stem mixing and compiling and routing. And so, yeah, the role of the mastering engineer grows immeasurably here and, and has to be integrated with mixing. It has to be considered similar, but I still think that it's helpful, as with all music production, to envision that there's a production mix phase and that there is a mastering phase. And although that mastering phase is certainly far from traditional... Uh, in comparison to some of our others, it still can be seen to serve the same purpose in the workflow. So outside of Pro Tools means that there's no way that the object metadata is going to import. You cannot, at this point, um, develop something in a different DAW with object information and then send that object information to me. It's all in panning. So we need to then reproduce that panning. And of course, this just comes to the problem with different DAWs not speaking to each other properly. But where there's a will, there's a way. And uh, for instance, with this respective record, which uh, can't talk about it too much right now, but will come out soon. Um, we're talking about tracks with, you know, sessions with 350 tracks that needed to be re-spatialized re to respect the initial artist's intent, but also maximize the potential of the Atmos uh, workflow. So in that combination, in that situation, I was a mix engineer, but then actually, I bounced it all down because, as we all know, 350 tracks takes your computer and just puts it into sixth gear. Um, I bounced it all down, stemmed it all down, and then so you know we can sequence the record accordingly, and and start to treat it um, more like a master in the sense that it's uh, a more stem-based condensed version. One of the other considerations here, of course, is up mix mastering. This is something that we're gonna be, we've seen already with a lot of the Atmos music that's out there in the world, specifically on things like Tidal HD. Um, a lot of it is pop music that has been upmixed. And, you know, tools from Nugent and Perfect Surround are very, very capable of doing some pretty convincing work in this department. Um, I've had some great success taking masters or mixes that are, you know, baked into their stereo format or their 5.1 or their 7.1 format and using tools from Nugent as well as this sonic environment to then bring the format into a 12-channel delivery, a 7.1.4, um, and as well as then take that 12-channel delivery and do unique things with objects for certain channels to try and at least maximize that scalable system. So the upmixing... The advantages uh, is that we can, you know, provide new content for the Dolby Atmos listeners uh, using just pre-existing stereo and multi-channel mixes and masters, um, and low production co costs, quick turnarounds. You know, there's there's only so much we can do, but that also means that it's uh, that it's quick and and quite convincing, I have to say. But of course, the disadvantages: it does not come close to using the full potential of object-based audio. And doesn't give me the opportunity to truly, you know, spatialize the music to um, what might be possible. Not always necessary, though. So it depends. It depends. As with all music, it depends. What does the music want? What serves the music best should always be our point of uh, departure. Um, but yes, it does not. This does not permit the fine tuning of objects, and we have to use these tools to manipulate it to get as far and close to what we want as possible. 
And then, of course, as mastering engineers, a lot of what we do is authoring. A lot of what we do is final master, master delivery. And so as a Dolby Atmos mastering engineer, I'm authoring Dolby Atmos uh, master file sets. I'm uploading those or helping an artist un understand uploading those to a service like Avid Play where Dolby then gets involved and makes the DDPJOC files, the AC4 IMS files, which then go to the respective streaming services. Um, in regards to that, I've designed my own workflows for testing um, in, in the sense that, you know, I'm using the AirPod Maxes, I'm using the AirPod Pros, I'm using my Odyssey headphones to check binaural fold-downs, to check object uh, fold-downs on the Apple's spatialized audio. I've actually been doing that for some time. It should actually get easier now that Apple's made their announcement, but um, regardless, I've been doing sonic averaging by checking how it's going to translate there. Same thing goes for Android. Uh, it's it's a you know whole new world for sonic averaging, but it's necessary. People are going to experience this largely on headphones. So yes, I'm listening in this glorious environment, but I have to consider as a mastering engineer how people are actually hearing it. Um, as a mastering engineer, super, supervise fold downs. Once you create a Dolby Atmos master file set, I have the ability as well with that master file because I've got the real Pro Tools session. It's not. Um, you know, j just a fold down or not, not just a sit, you know, 12 channel file um, that I can do supervised fold downs and supervised masters for 5171, 712 if that's necessary, uh, or ambisonics, etc. cetera. Um, I have also been, up until this point, making binaural masters. The binaural fold down from Atmos with a little bit of supervision is quite convincing, it's quite inspiring and engaging. And for users who have wanted to make uh, binaural records, including myself, um, I think that it's it's absolutely worth considering. And then, of course, the the binaural stereo, any of these discrete channel uh, fold downs, can then be mastered using you know more more traditional mastering methods as well uh, to guarantee their translation into the world. And the last one that I'll bring to the table is Pure Audio Blu-ray. Uh, MSM in Munich, run by Stefan Bach, who's the uh, sort of chief engineer and also the design, like the the inventor of the Pure Audio Blu-ray format. Um, Pure Audio Blu-ray is a brilliant audiophile grade way to experience Dolby Atmos music. Just as a recap, the mixing and mastering process is absolutely intertwined in many ways here, but I still think it's important to understand that our role as a mastering engineer, my role as a mastering engineer, and what I can offer to the process can absolutely be discreet and is still absolutely necessary. And I think it also, like with stereo pr music producers who are working in inspiring environments but not mastering great environments, it, it gives the confidence and the freedom. My goal with this particular facility even is to work largely with um, the independent artists that I do work with. I mean, I enjoy working with labels and I'll you know, work with any music really, but of course, music is music to me. But um, for those independent artists who maybe are producing on headphones the entire time, doing all, doing all of this in binaural, then, then we can come here and I can guarantee that translation is going to work. I can fine tune their mix right down to those, those degrees. Um, and so it's full on, Multi-channel, object-based STEM mastering is sort of my uh, take on this, certainly thus far. So I hope this helps. I hope it brings some clarity. Um, I look forward to connecting with people making music in this format, and it would be my pleasure to help bring it into the world. Um, and, you know, uh, keep in touch. Please do subscribe to the YouTube channel, check out the other videos, and visit www.immersivemastering.com. Have a great day.